I didn't think so. Well, how's it been so far? You guys have, some of you have been here a long time. I'm glad to hear that. I'm glad to hear that. So we're going to talk a little bit about uh, higher education. And uh, I thought I would actually start with a little bit of uh, sort of background. American higher education is actually kind of a strange animal and uh, really has changed a lot in the last hundred years. It's about a thousand years, literally, I'm not making that up, it's about a thousand years that we have been doing higher education in the world the way we understand it now. What we think of as college started at Oxford about a thousand years ago. Uh, for about 900 years, it was almost exactly the same. And in the last 100 years, we radically changed it, like we do with many other things, actually. And so I want to talk about, though, how we sort of get that sort of initial change that brings us to where we are today. And then I want to talk about sort of what that looks like and what we can expect going forward. And I want to spend a little time maybe at the end talking about uh, the college at St. Constantine and how we try to do things a little differently, maybe. Uh, but I do want to start by talking about Oxford, uh, because that sort of is the sort of the mothership of higher education. Uh, it's where uh, C.S. Lewis both got his education and then, uh, of course, he was a professor as well. Uh, I'm a big fan of C.S. Lewis. He has a, a, a great book called, uh, his, a number of them, one of my favorites, is called That Hideous Strength. It's the last of the books in the Space Trilogy. And uh, there's actually a great picture in there of, a, of a, an Oxford don. He's not in Oxford, but you know, a, a college professor in that tradition. Uh, in a tutorial with one of his students, he, it's coming up. He just doesn't want to do it because he knows. Here's the thing. He knows his students so well, he knows which ones he wants to hang out with and which ones he doesn't want to hang out with. And this is one of the ones he doesn't want to hang out with. Uh, I mentioned that tutorial because that was the backbone of education at the college level uh, up until about 100 years ago. Now, tutorial, I think, requires some explanation because it, it's kind of lost its meaning for us. It's so far outside of our experience that we don't even know what that means. Uh, a, a tutorial in the Oxford tradition and now in the Constantine tradition uh, involves one professor, one student, sitting down together over a period of time, an hour, hour and a half, going over either a book that student has read or a paper that student has written. Uh, we do this every day here at St. Constantine with our college students. I do this uh, every week. I'll do it several times. We have, uh, we have seven college students right now. At some time or other, I'm with each one of them. And they will bring a paper they've written. We'll go line by line. We'll read it together. Uh, we'll sort of we'll, we'll look at their argument. Are, it, where are the weaknesses? Where are the strengths? Uh, how can the writing itself be better? Uh, what do these arguments teach us about the bigger picture that whatever it is they're responding to might have to offer us? We do that day after day after day. Uh, it's a very powerful form of education. Uh, you can imagine, though, right, one-on-one. -on -one, I was at a, uh, I won't name names, I was, I was visiting uh, a university, uh, a state university here in Texas. Not the state university, but one of the other ones. Uh, and they were, they were kind of bragging and did the whole tour, right, the whole admissions tour. And they were bragging about their small class size. Three quarters of their classes have 50 or fewer students. I don't consider 50 small when I sit in my office with one person on a regular basis. 50 seems rather large to me. Uh, and there's a little, a little, I'm foreshadowing the rest of my presentation, I guess, when I say this. Uh, the trick there, when they say three quarters, the one quarter is all of the gen ed stuff. So the vast majority of everything a freshman and sophomore does is larger than 50. Like it'll be two years maybe till you see a class smaller than that. And that's, those, you know, the, the, the major courses might be small, but that's not unusual at lots of schools. Uh, nothing to brag about when they say that our, co our classes have only 50 students in them. I wrote a, uh, years ago it seems like, maybe another lifetime even, I wrote a little book, very little book. You might even call it a pamphlet, it's so small. Uh, on William Blackstone, the English uh, jurist, the uh, sort of the person who sort of articulated uh, the, the English common law for us in written form. And uh, Blackstone was actually, he was, a, uh, he was an Oxford professor uh, at Pembroke College. This is tricky, he was at Pembroke College at both Oxford and Cambridge, and so easy to confuse the two. Uh, I don't know why they would do that, but they did. Uh, but uh, Blackstone uh, illustrates something here. Uh, at Oxford, uh, the way this worked was you had that tutorial on a regular basis, right? You would go there. Uh, you didn't necessarily take exams. They took one big exam at the end. Uh, and that sort of determined whether you sort of, you know, graduated or not. And it wasn't a heavily graded. They had like, you know, like four gradations, uh, two of which were passing. Uh, so it was basically a glorified pass-fail system. And how did you learn what you needed to learn? You learned through the tutorial. And if there were gaps, you kind of filled them in yourself 
one of two ways. You would read books to learn more, and that professor might encourage you to read, here, you know, here are the three books you should read to understand this better. Uh, the other thing they would do is attend lectures. Now, this is kind of funny. They would do that as sort of a supplemental thing for students who needed the extra work. That's what we do now all the time as the main thing, right? Lecturing is the usual course uh, that one takes in college. Uh, at, at Oxford, it was quite different, right? Uh, the, the lecture was sort of a supplement and that's how, how Blackstone got started, by the way. You would pay extra for it. That wasn't included. Like, so you, when you paid your tuition at the university, you know, the college within the university, you paid for the tutorials. If you wanted more, you'd pay a little extra. You might pay a couple of pounds and go to five or six lectures by, uh, you know, who was not person, by the way, not necessarily on the faculty at all. That person was a visiting lecturer in many cases. That's how Blackstone got his start as a visiting lecturer. He eventually became a professor, but uh, in the meantime, he wrote this giant set of books. Something we take utterly for granted, and we kind of do it here, but we kind of, we massage it a little bit, which I'll explain in a moment. Um, for us in America, also now in Britain, oddly enough, uh, the, the, the only sort of, the, the numbers that count, the only way we begin to measure education, there's the grade, obviously, but we look at credit units or, or credit hours, right? You've heard those terms, right? How do we measure uh, a student's progress? We measure it in credit hours. If you've earned you know, 30 credit hours, you're now a sophomore, right? And, we, and you need uh, 125 to graduate from this institution. How, what's, a, what's a credit hour? Uh, it's a tricky term all the way around because it's not an hour usually, it's 50 minutes usually. Uh, so already you're shortchanged, 10 minutes, right? Uh, where does it come from? I need to, we need to back up a little bit. Some of you have heard of Andrew Carnegie, uh, a philanthropist who, uh, later in his life, he had made his fortune already and uh, was sort of becoming sort of more full-time philanthropist, less of the sort of steel magnate, right? Uh, he had this concern, and it was a legitimate concern in the early 1900s. Uh, college professors were not paid very well. That hasn't changed much since then. Uh, so little, in fact, that very rarely were they able to kind of save money for that time when they could no longer teach and do the, and, and, you know, what you know, we now call retirement, right? Uh, so many would, would die in other, utter poverty. It was kind of a sad situation. So he had this notion of a kind of private pension plan that he would fund out of his, out of his trust uh, to help those retired professors who, you know, because of the, 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 the poverty of their lives, had not really been able to acquire, you know, save up uh, money to live off of it in retirement. But how do you know, you follow me here, how do you know whether that person really was like a professor, really devoted his life to it, or just kind of messed around with it, you know, and did a little bit on the side and that what? So how do you measure, you follow what I'm saying, the output of a professor? Well, one way you might measure it is how much time he spent doing it. So ironically, the credit unit was originally intended to measure how much work a professor did, not how much a student learned. In fact, it was never intended to measure a student's learning. It can't possibly. What does it actually measure? How much time does your student spend in class? Some of you can probably attest to this. Does that tell you how much the student learned? It doesn't tell you anything about whether you, you, I've known students who spend all day in school, don't learn a darn thing, right? Uh, I've known others who, in a, you know, in five minutes can master a subject that takes another kid an hour and a half to get. Time doesn't measure that, but that's what the credit unit is, and that's the only way, essentially, we measure degrees in America. You put in the time, literally, you put your butt in a seat for a certain amount of time, and you get a degree. And again, never intended to do that. The Carnegie unit, which became the credit unit, which became the credit hour, was never meant for that. But here's the thing, it's measurable, right? You can measure it. How do you measure what a student has learned? I'm not saying that's impossible. I think we do it quite well. I think the, the oral exams we do tell me a great deal about what a student knows. But that's hard, right? It takes a lot of effort, a lot of time, right? It's, it's a lot of input into that student to, to understand that. Uh, way better just to say, ah, he was in class for 15 hours this semester, or whatever, right? Uh, the analogy I like to use is like, if you imagine uh, in the days before radar, right? We want to, how fast is this car going? But we don't know. Well, let's measure the length of it. Well, it doesn't tell me how fast the car is going, right? But I know how long it is. That's what we do with students when it comes to learning. We measure the time they spend in class. Uh, Originally, uh, the, the first colleges in America, Harvard, Yale, uh, William and Mary, Penn, those are the four oldest, don't tell the people at Princeton, they get upset. <laughs> they were all modeled on that same Oxford system. They, they essentially did a tutorial method, they would do the occasional lectures uh, in support of that. Uh, 
the big turning point, it begins to change a bit in the 1900s, but the big turning point is World War II. It's the most significant change for the following reasons. Uh, not a bad thing, right? But vets coming home from World War II, uh, we wanted to, in some way, sort of both honor, but also sort of uh, help them transition from war to uh, peacetime. And somebody had the notion, well, what if they went to college? Now, that might to us seem perfectly natural. Uh, but at the time, you understand, less than 10% of Americans went to college. Way more than 10% of Americans of that age group went to war, right? So when they came back, through the GI Bill, we offered to pay for college for hundreds of thousands of people, many times the current size of the college population. And many people took the government up on that. So uh, it, it was overwhelming the system, right? There were, there were colleges in America, there were universities, but uh, put this in some perspective. When Oxford uh, was sort of came together, coalesced, as a university, it, there was a series of colleges before this, right? But as a coalesce as a university, it's about the 15th century. It was a long time ago. At that time, it was just over about 100 students or so in the village of Oxford. By 1900, there were still only about 1,000 students in all of Oxford University. It wasn't very large. Uh, the same was happening in America, right? Harvard opened with a couple of dozen students, and that's it. Uh, I don't know what its population was in 1900, but it couldn't have been more than a few hundred students. After World War II, those universities found themselves with thousands of students coming in, like order of magnitude difference. How do you go from 100 to 1,000? Now, how many people do you hire? Think of what I just said. What, who do you hire to teach at universities? Well, you need people with the right credentials, the right educational background, to, but where do you get them? Right? You, you can't just sort of, I used to be you know, a plumber and then I became a college professor. No, you need right, an extensive education. You can't just build those up in a year or two or even maybe a generation. So I, I'm not criticizing when I say this, right? But what do you do to solve that problem? Well, what if we stop the one-on-one -on -one tutorial stuff? Because that's where all the time is. And what if we do more of this lecture thing on the other side? We make that the centerpiece. So again, the credit union becomes the way of measuring, because it's measurable. Right? It doesn't measure the thing we want, but at least you can measure it. Uh, the idea that we need to stuff more people in through the GI Bill, through all the veterans coming home from the war, changes sort of the, 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 the dynamics of that, it became very easy to just stuff more people into the class. In fact, it was almost necessary, right? 10 went to 25, 25 went to 100, 100 went to 1,000 pretty quickly. Because there's no, at, at, the, at first it was just, well, we'll just add a few more seats, right? It's an easy, easy adjustment to make. That we, usually we have, you know, 10 people in our seminar, we'll make it 20, right? Uh, but why stop there? If you're not measuring the outcome anymore, right? Through the one-on-one -on -one tutorial, you know what's happening. Like, look, I know where my students are. I, I, you might, I only have seven of them, but I know every one of them very, very well. I know exactly what they know. I may know better than they do what they know. I couldn't do that with 700 students, though, right? I couldn't. But what I could do is say the thing I'm going to say, read my lecture to them, right? Does it matter if there are 20 kids in the room or 100 kids in the room or 1,000 kids in the room? Right, you see how the, a small compromise, we're going to add a few more, add a few more, it became very easy to add infinitely more. What, where do you stop? If the technology allows me to speak to 10,000 people at a time, which a massively uh, open online course does, right, then I do speak to 10,000. Why, why stop there? What's, if it's pa once you get past one, there's no stopping point as long as technology supports it, which, you know, we can do that. Oh, this is problematic. I just finished the first page of my notes. Whew, we're going to be here a long time. I mean, you guys don't have plans for dinner, do you? So let me, um, I'm going to, I don't know if I can do this without dropping anything. I'm going to put this in my pocket. Don't tell Megan I did that, all right? But I'm going to go over to the board here because uh, first thing we need to think about when we talk about education today, higher education today, uh, we now have huge classes compared to the history of higher education, right? There's, as I said, in the last 100 years, we have in an unprecedented way, uh, o o way oversized our course. It's, just, it's a totally different thing compared to what maybe what it used to be. So as that happens, though, right, so you have all these, these soldiers returning home, entering our colleges and universities, it became kind of a, a sort of a, almost an expectation, if you were going to succeed in America, now you have to go to college. Again, prior to that, a very small percentage of Americans went to college. After that, it's sort of normal, or at least expected. If you want to, if you want to climb up that ladder, you got to go up. You know, you got to go up it through college. 
probably shouldn't surprise you that that had the effect of sort of turning education to, to a kind of commodity, right? Something you buy and sell. Uh, the, uh, I don't know, to this day, I'm not sure I understand how Oxford sort of existed uh, financially. Like, uh, how could they pay for any of that? They charged almost nothing for, to almost nobody. And th these enormous buildings that are beautiful are still there. I, I, just, I think God did that. I don't know how it's possible. <laughs> exactly, right. And then came Oxford, right, right. <laughs> but in America, especially in the second half of the 20th century, uh, it really became a kind of business. And, and I think you see that if, you, if you've spent much time at most college campuses, uh, you can see it, is, it, is, it operates very much like a business does. Uh, the financial side of colleges can be, it, it can be very confusing, um, but I can say this. Once the, once the government got involved in helping pay for college, if you understand even a little bit of economics, and I'll bet most of you do, right? Supply and demand. These are laws. They're called laws, not even theories, right? These are the laws of supply and demand. Uh, if you increase the demand, right, what happens? So if the government puts some money in your pocket and says, you can have this if you go to college, Right? So people go to college. They weren't going to go before, but now they're going to go because they have this money. What does that do to the price of the commodity? What does that do to the price of college? Of course it goes up. It can't not go up. Which is great, I guess, if you have the subsidy in your hand. But what if you don't have the subsidy? What if you're one of those people? Right? Well, now it costs a lot more, that's all. Uh, other factors go into this, but, and it's way more complicated than I've just implied. <laughs> uh, but fair to say, the, the cost of college in the second half of the 20th century rose, I'm not kidding, about five times faster than inflation. There's almost no other commodity that compares to it. You understand, the gen this is going to feel odd to you, the general trend of commodity prices is to go down over time. We get better at making them, we get more efficient, right? If you adjust for the actual the value of the money, adjust for inflation, the cost of most of the goods you buy actually go down over time, not college. College goes up and up and up at a, an astronomic rate. Uh, I checked this out last year, 2017. The inflation rate in America was about 2%. The average cost of tuition went up about 8.5%. Why is that? And that's not a new thing. That's been going on for decades. How can that be? It has to do with sort of the artificial stimulation of demand. So the costs uh, are outrageous, and the prices get inflated pretty quickly. So along comes, of course, then there's the, the part that gets, so all this is just, these are just, this is what happens, this is just a fact. I, again, I'm not, I'm not criticizing, I'm glad that those soldiers had that chance. I'm glad that generations of Americans were able to go to college and hadn't before. Uh, increasing tuition is problematic, but maybe it's a symptom of growth. Okay, I can live with all that. Here's where it starts to kind of morally bother me. Uh, it's the game that we call financial aid. It really is a kind of game. Some of you maybe know this, but if you don't know this, you need to understand what's going to happen, uh, sadly, in your lives. It's a little bit of a scheme, and here's how it goes. So colleges and universities, they put up a, often we call it the sticker price. Uh, a typical private school might be thirty-five, forty thousand dollars $40,000 a year. I don't, I don't know intimately the finances of any of you, and I don't want to. That's fine. Uh, but if you're at all like me, $40,000 seems like a lot of money. <laughs> Times four seems like an impossibly large sum of money. Like, mm, okay, I don't know what you're going to do, son, but... <clears throat> and I have three of them. Oh, my goodness. Can I just buy several houses instead? <laughs> but that's a sticker price, right? Turns out... Almost nobody pays the sticker price. And I know this direct because I, I, look, I've, I've, I've worked at a number, I've actually, I've counted six different colleges and universities before I, became, before I came here. Uh, I know how this works. I've been on the other side of it a lot. Nobody expects anybody to pay the sticker price. It's very rare. You know who pays the sticker price? This is a strange combination. You have to be very wealthy and very dumb. <laughs> or a graduate student. Or a graduate student, then you're just stuck, right? It's up to you, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so I'm, I should, I should call, I'm speaking of undergraduate education at this point. It's, it's a whole different animal when we talk about graduate school. The, uh, the reason nobody pays that is because, look, they're going to sit down with you, right? And, and, and it's just a session. It'll just be maybe you and your spouse and your son or daughter, and uh, you'll sit down with a counselor, and they're going to make a very special offer to you. We, we have a scholarship for you, very special scholarship. It's the you scholarship. It's just, just for you. 
And we're gonna, you know, we're gonna take that thirty thousand down to twenty thousand, because we, you're just, your son is so great. They have that conversation with everybody, every single person, because again, they don't expect them to pay that. It's kind of means tested, sort of. So depending on how much you make, you know, your household income, if it's larger, that number might be a little smaller. If it's less, it might be a little bigger. But they come fully intending to give you the special offer, but it's not special at all. It's absolutely normal. Where's the gap get filled? And the gap gets filled in largely two things. Uh, the federal government will pay some of that on your behalf. S could be a very small number, could be a larger number. Uh, but the, the government doesn't have all that much money to spend, so the rest of it is made up with student loans, right? And this is where, again, I think this is where the morality of the whole thing, I think, is very su suspicious. Uh, just borrow money to pay the difference. Now, if your son or daughter is 18 years old, uh, how much should a person borrow to go to college? The average last year was a little north of $30,000, and that's an average. So think about everybody, you know, an average in a, in a normal distribution, right, is about the halfway point. That means half pay more than that in student loan debt, right? Uh, when you start to subtract from that people who like, um, uh, you know, athletes, ROTC scholarships, when you start to take off the bottom, which don't pay anything for other reasons because somebody else is going to pay for them, right? There's no debt there, but you have other obligations. Uh, lots of students are carrying a very heavy debt load. And I've seen cases, l absolutely legitimate cases, of students who had $100,000 of undergraduate debt. They didn't, this is not, we're not talking graduate school yet, right? That's, is it worth it? Like, how much education should you get for $100,000 in debt? That better be absolutely life-changing because the debt will be life-changing for sure. No, absolutely not, yeah. So, okay, so since you brought it up, uh, it used to be a pretty good value proposition, right? You'd pay some money and, again, an ever-increasing amount of money, but what your potential to earn on the other side of that was dramatically increased, right? So college was a good buy, even though it seems expensive on the front end. That, that's still kind of true, but it's no longer as universally true as it used to be. In my generation, it was such an obvious deal that, of course, you went to college. Naturally, you should. This is how you... But it's getting to the point where it's starting to break about even, and the trend is going the other way. So this is sort of in the back of my mind. At what point, at what point do parents and students say, well, that just it's not worth it to me anymore? Even if I want to go to college, should I spend that much money, go that far in debt to pay for it? When in fact, maybe I could just get the vocational training and sort of, you know, sort of the, the dirty little secret alongside of that, of course, is that uh, Oxford did not start as a vocational institution, right? It wasn't teaching you to become a thing. It was teaching you to become a man, right? It was teaching you to become a responsible person. But we've, we've, turned we've turned higher education to absolutely so very much a vocational training sector, right? That's what we do. We prepare you for a profession of some sort or a job. Uh, but it's a bit of a trick because you really could gain those skills in some other way. It doesn't cost you $30,000 a year. All right? It doesn't cost tens of thousands of dollars of debt to get there. Uh, even as we speak, I think some industries are starting to, to figure this out. Like, why should we hire college students who don't, still don't know what we need them to? Right? This is, so, Yes, they've had this vocational training, but I still have to train them more because they didn't learn the things I need them to learn, says the, says the employer, right? How about we just skip all that, teach them what they need to know. You don't go into debt. Start working when you're 20 instead of 24, right? Uh, there's a bubble there that's about to burst, I think. We'll talk about that more in a second. Did you ever stop to ask, what do universities do with all this money? Like, that's, that's the other half of it, right? So, yes, you're going to spend a lot of money. The federal government's going to spend a lot of money. And you're going to go into all this debt. Like, wow, that should be, we should have the best stuff ever, right? And we kind of do, maybe. Um, I've known several universities from the budgetary side. Like, uh, most professors, you don't usually spend a lot of time. You don't want to know what the budget is. It's, it's unpleasant. But when you... Uh, when you enter administration, and I, look, I never chose that. It chose me, all right? 
I remember once when I was a graduate student, I was at the University of Virginia, and I had a, I was on the student government. I met the, had a meeting with the provost of the, and I, yeah, that's a big deal. University of Virginia's provost is an important guy. And I don't remember what we were talking about, but I remember afterwards, he took a moment to ask me sort of, oh, what I was studying, uh, what my dissertation was about. He was, you know, the usual academic questions. And I was telling him sort of my aspirations and so forth. And he finally, after indulging me for about five minutes, he said, well, have you ever considered going into administration? And I said, oh, no, no, I'd never consider going into administration. <laughs> He said, that's good. I would never hire anybody who wanted to. <laughs> I have known, though, from the administrative side, uh, and this is pretty typical, the, the, the budget of a university is ordinarily less than a third of that budget will be devoted to academic matters. Two-thirds or more, 70, 75 percent sometimes, goes to non-academic expenses. When I say academic, I mean like that's the salaries of the professors. Like the, what are we there for? 30%, that's what we pay for. The, what's, what's the other 70% buy you? Well, let's think about that. What does it buy you? It buys you, it buys you lots of administrators. I won't, again, I'm not naming any names, I, but I, I was at another school some years ago that had a, uh, the president's cabinet so this was just a glorified name for sort of all the administrators getting together. At that meeting, so I was actually a department chair, so I was, the, I was one of two people who were at both of meetings. Right? So there's the faculty meeting and there's the president's cabinet. The president's cabinet had 16 people in attendance. It's a small school. Uh, the faculty meeting had 15 people in attendance. <laughs> there were more administrators than faculty members. That's actually not unusual. Uh, now, look, obviously, the, usually there are more faculty members than administrators. But wh who pays for the salaries? Because, look, those people aren't doing the teaching, right? They aren't educating the students, right? They're not recruiting them. They're not, they're not helping them to graduate. But there's a lot of them, right? Where do, and those are, by the way, those are the, those are the good salaries. Uh, I, I, I shouldn't say this out loud again. Uh, it would not be unusual for like a vice presidential of administrator to make three or four times what a professor does. That's quite normal. So who pays for that? Well, you pay for that. Now, what, what does the college get for that? I, I don't even want to speculate. There's lots of reasons why you might have lots of administration, but there's a great deal of, of, of administrative bloat at most, at most colleges and universities. It's not just administration. There are other non-academic uh, programs that get a lot of funding at a lot of schools. So that money goes somewhere, but where it doesn't go, oddly enough, is into the classroom with your student. A very small portion of it goes there. Again, you can sort of see why I might have sort of certain misgivings uh, about that situation. As we look ahead, again, I've mentioned before, there's, I think there's a kind of economic bubble that's, that's going to have to burst soon. Uh, you can't indefinitely outstrip inflation by that much. No commodity can do that, right? That just can't. It's not. It's not long term. It's not long term feasible. That's not going to go on that way. Uh, but what what does it look like if it doesn't go on? Uh, let's say, for example, some relatively large portion of Americans decides, forget it. I don't need college, or I don't need it at that cost. Uh, where do you get the cheaper version? Well, you go to community college. That's a cheaper version. Uh, the the only problem with that is, of course, it's also you kind of get what you pay for in that regard, right? It's often not the best of educations. So how do you trade that off? Uh, maybe you go directly to vocational training. Uh, some fairly large firms whose names you would recognize have, are now not requiring college degrees of, of their employees if you'll come to this four-month program and learn what you need to learn to do the job here. Uh, that's a good deal for you if you're, you know, four years of your life and tens of thousands of dollars or four months of my life and a good job on the other end of it for sure. Right, so yeah, that's a, that's a bubble, and if many people start taking you know, option B instead of option A, what happens, there are almost 4,000 colleges and universities in the United States, 4,000, that's a lot. Uh, I'm going to make a prediction right now. I'm being recorded, so I guess I'm on the, on the, on the record here. Uh, there will not be 4,000 in 10 years. Uh, I'll be surprised if there are 2,000 in 10 years. We probably have more than we're going to need in the future if we continue to go down this road. And I see no reason that we're not going to continue going down this road. Like, I don't see colleges in a position to change the way they do business. They have a sort of a model, and they're going to continue to follow the model. This is fine, by the way, again, if you are Harvard or Yale or Stanford, right? Or even, uh, even sort of the, the, the better state schools. 
Uh, one of the parents in the earlier session uh, made reference to the engineering program at Texas A&M. That's a fine program. It's not going anywhere, right? The, so schools will, understand what I'm saying, will disappear. Schools you know by name, oh, I know that. But it might not be there in a few years. But the, the elite ones, will, they will. Like, so the people who want that sort of experience and are kind of okay with sort of the cost, right? Or the, you know, so there's still that market. It'll be there. But the elite ones will be the ones who capture it still. Right, uh, it's the rest of the school, sort of the and, and sort of the bottom version, right? The the very low cost school that you know where you know sort of again get what you pay for the community college types. They'll be there too, right? It's the middle that's going to start to go away. But that the middle is where a lot of education happens, right? It's where a lot of students are, right? Most of us don't go to elite schools, and many of us don't go to community colleges. It's, it's the bulk in the middle where uh, the problems are going to be felt. I think the the high the, the most. They'll do what they've been doing, I think. The classes will get bigger and bigger and bigger. Because, again, you can always add more seats to the class. That doesn't make the education better. I think it makes it worse. But they can always do that. Uh, I think you can expect over the next few years, tuition will continue to rise at, a, at an extraordinary rate. Again, at least outstripping inflation. Uh, colleges will continue, right, because of that sort of the, the, the bloat there, right? They're, they're very disconnected uh, from sort of regular life. Right, what happens politically, culturally in America is way different than what happens politically and culturally on a college campus, right? Because of that disconnection. Uh, that's, gonna, that's not changing anytime soon. Uh, you can expect that to continue, I think. It's the declining value proposition that's going to be the problem. As many parents start to, and, and students start to realize, I don't, I don't want to take on that debt. I don't want to do that. Uh, maybe I could do something else. Those kinds of, uh, these are kinds of deceptions, really. And they, they, these kind of deceptions have they've been bothering me for a while. People like uh, you know, Dr. Reynolds, our president, I think as well. And uh, that's a big part of the motivation for trying to kind of you know, reinvent higher education a little bit here at, at St. Constantine. When we had the opportunity to think about, what about doing college differently? Uh, you know, I've been doing this a long time, uh, almost 20 years. Uh, Dr. Reynolds even longer than I have. Uh, we've seen a lot and understand, I think, a lot about sort of what's wrong. Uh, what, we, what we lacked, of course, were the resources to do anything about it, right? Uh, and still, in many ways, oh, oh, I lack resources. Let me tell you about lack of resources. I have almost nothing to speak of. But, but on the other hand, uh, you know, the, the original colleges that came together to be Oxford University also lacked resources. Resources were not the thing they had in abundance. What they had were knowledgeable people and students who had a desire to learn from them. Uh, you put a good professor and a good student in the same room, that's magic happens, right? That can be done. And doesn't, you, don't need, you don't need a climbing wall. Every, every university I visited with my son, every single one of them had a climbing wall. <laughs> the only other thing I can say about every single one of them, it's always on the tour. The climbing wall's always on the tour. They make sure we see the climbing wall. We never saw anybody on the climbing wall. Apparently, to, to operate a college in Texas, you must have a climbing wall. So I guess we'll work on getting ours in place soon, but we don't have it yet. I'll do what I can, I promise. I guess so. If you're six, we have one for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a good one, actually. I like ours. Don't sit on top, though. Don't sit on top. If you get up on top, would you tell everybody else not to sit on top? We think that, again, Old Oxford had it right uh, in terms of the class size. Uh, more and more students does not make it better and better, right? More and more uh, detracts from our ability to understand our students, right? To actually reach them, to, uh, to be sure that they're actually mastering the content. The amount of time they spend in the room has nothing to do with what they learn. That was the reason originally for the tutorial. I'll know what you know by the end of that, right? So when we think of, of huge classes, no, we, we perform. That used to be a good marker, I think. Invisible ink. The one-on-one -on -one tutorial, which I constitutes about half of the credit hours you earn at St. Constantine. We do do credit hours, right? You can't not do it in America. You couldn't be accredited and not measure your degrees by credit hours. So we do credit hours. Uh, we'll turn it into credit. You, look, it's a it's waving a magic wand anyway. Uh, it's already a charade, right, the way it's done now. Uh, 
we take what you sort of what what we, what we give you and sort of chop it up into kind of a credit hour format. So you get a transcript that looks exactly like anybody else's transcript. Uh, it's no different in that way. The experience is radically different, though. Uh, so about half of your credit hours are earned through tutorials, one on one. The other half are in seminars that do the math. If we cap our incoming class, which we do at 15, right, you will never have a seminar larger than 15. Uh, at the very largest, that would be the largest group you'd ever have. To, you'd ever uh, be um, in, in, in uh, a, a lecture with. Pricing, again, is another problem. I think that higher education, as we know, it faces. Uh, it really is super inflated. We actually, this comes as a shock to a lot of people, we don't participate in federal financial aid. Uh, we don't accept it, that's, which sounds, oh, but that's how I can afford it. No, 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 you can afford it, right? If we price it absent the aid, right? Imagine that didn't exist, right? The inflated price that comes with that doesn't have to be that way. Uh, so we end up pricing it at a much different rate. I'm gonna tell you something, so you guys are gonna be among the first to hear this publicly. Um, we were just finalizing our tuition for 2019, next school year. Uh, for the year, we're gonna charge a flat $9,000. <laughs> that's, the, that's the reaction you should have, yes. <clears throat> uh, that's pretty cheap on one hand, right? Uh, now look, there is one other expense you have. You do have to buy the books. Here's the beauty of it though. Uh, great books are very cheap, actually. <laughs> if you ever priced textbooks, Everything I've just been saying about the racket, the scheme, the game that is financial aid, textbooks are worse. I don't know how those people live with themselves. How do they sleep at night? The textbooks are super inflated in cost. $200 is not unusual for a science book. Does it have $200 worth of stuff inside? It doesn't have $200 worth of paper, that's for sure. Uh, it's also, it's not as though, I've been on the other side, it's not as though the professor's making a ton of money. The guy who wrote it is making some of that, but a very small part. The publisher's making a fortune. And then next year, often next year, not, I'm not saying like 10 years later, next year, well, we're going to do an updated version. So you can't even sell that $200 book to your friend who's taking the class next year, because next year it's a whole different book. So that $200 science book is now literally a doorstopper for you. It can hold up the leg of your broken coffee table, maybe. How much would you spend for that? Not much. You can get the collected works of Plato, all of them, every, including some we're not even sure he wrote. <laughs> Big, thick book. That's $60. That is the entire... Right, that's the entire reading for our juniors this year, this fall. Like, 60 bucks, that is their, that is their book. They're doing, it's the Plato seminar, oddly enough. They're gonna read through all of it. There's a lot in there, right? But that's way different. It's a, different, I mean, it's a whole different thing than the textbook market. So uh, can it be affordable? It can be affordable. Just think about what I said. If 30% is normally, right, what most schools, what colleges devote to academics and 70% to not academics, what if you just didn't do the not academic part? We don't have a climbing wall, I'm sorry about that. Uh, administrative bloat, if you're looking for that, you're <laughs> we were talking about that, right? As long as you're like, you know, under 10, we got the climbing wall for you. Or if you are, in fact, very short, yeah. We, maybe we need a, like a size limit for our college students. We don't accept anybody over five foot one. <clears throat> or we charge you more, maybe. <clears throat> the, uh, so some of those things you're not gonna get here, right? And if those things are important to you, look, you have, what, 3,999 other options out there <laughs> to choose from. You can get those things if that's important, and you maybe you should, right? There's a reason, there are good reasons maybe that is a good thing to do in, in, for many families. But what if you didn't need that? Why pay for it, right? So how about 30% of the 30,000 or something like that um, instead of all of it, right? That's about where we are, in fact. If you do the math, that's about where we come down, right? The academic part is the part you pay for. So. How about instead simply a fair price for what you're getting? And you can see, but huh, wonder how this goes together. I'm not making this up. This is actually true stuff. Uh, we'll skip the bloat entirely. You know what my title is? I have to explain this to my father too. He doesn't get it either. Um, my title is provost, which I, I've been told. I, oh, I don't. I don't speak Latin, and I, I feel like. Sometimes I feel like I'm, I'm the only one here who doesn't. 
my younger son is doing it. Oh, yeah, oh this. But I understand it comes from the word, just means to lead. The, the, where, in which direct, for, in what, I don't know. Uh, I don't feel like I do much leading. Uh, when it comes to our buildings, for example, they seem to do the leading, and I follow them. <laughs> I do whatever they tell me to do, those buildings. Provost is usually a very, it's a significant thing, right? So that's a prestigious office, right? Uh, at many schools, there'll be a provost, some number, several associate provosts, assistant provosts, and what do they do? They provost. <laughs> half of my job, half of my time here is spent teaching. Uh, I, don't, I don't know of any other school where that is true, actually. I've, and I've been around a lot. I don't know any place where administrators, even at the highest level, teach that kind of teaching load. Uh, I, I've been with the president. I was there for eight years. There's all oh, the president teaches too. I saw him teach part of one course over six years. I'm not sure that counts as actually teaching. Uh, and that's more than most presidents and provosts and others typically do at most schools, right? That's a full time. So get rid of the bloat. Who needs that? You don't need that if you're not administering a bunch of non academic programs. And in fact, if you are administering academic programs, maybe you should have your hand in them sometimes. Maybe you should know about what's going on there. Right, so leaving the classroom is actually not a great way to lead professors and students. I think you should be in the classroom, and, and that's what we do here. So we don't have the giant bloat, which means then you don't need to borrow a ton of money. Think about this with me just for a moment. What if an what if incoming college freshman were to take the summer work full time, like, you know, work hard over the summer, save your money. Maintain, lots of people, maybe some of you did this, I did this when I was in college, maintain a part time job during the school year, uh, not, not a, maybe, you know, 15 hours, something like that. You do the math on that, you're pretty close to the $9,000 you need to pay for the whole thing. Now there could be other expenses, I mean, if you're, where you're going to live, how you going to account for that, so there, uh, but you don't need to borrow 30, 40, 50, 100,000 dollars to do that. Right? You don't need all that debt if you're not paying for all those ancillary things that, frankly, have nothing to do with your education. Again, why are you here? So how about we just do a no debt version? It's a phrase Dr. Reynolds likes to use, and I'm, I'm going to start stealing it from him. He'll probably find out eventually. Uh, but he coined it. He says, um, he says, loans are not financial aid. It is not aiding you financially to go into massive debt. Right, so maybe let's just not do that. Let's price it in a way that's, a, that's affordable, but covers the actual cost, the real cost of the education. And then we don't strap our graduates with this giant load on their shoulders the day they walk off our campus. Um, I think it's just a, so, it's a much better um, opportunity for everybody involved that way. We're very near the end of our time, so I'm going to stop here in just a moment. I probably should say something very f nice and flattering about uh, our college. I guess I should. Um, I won't. I, I, look, it's not a sales pitch. That's not why I'm here, right? You guys. If you want a sales pitch, let me know. I'll give you one, right? <laughs> Personally, one-on-one, -on -one, like a little sales pitch tutorial. But I, let me just sort of cycle back and say, you know, for the better part of a thousand years, 900 of those thousand years, uh, we taught good students very well. As, I mean, in the West, we were good at this. Uh, we still do it, but we've lost, we've lost a lot of it. Uh, in terms of just the quality of what we do, because we try to make it in a way, sort of turn it into a commodity, turn it into a measurable thing in that way. Uh, it just doesn't lend itself to that. Education is a relationship. It's not really a commodity. Uh, we live in the real world, so we do have to do things like, you know, pay salaries and pay, you know, expenses and so forth. So we do that, and that's fine. Uh, and Oxford did too. They made it work as well. Uh, so in uh, one way, that's not new at all. But the model that they pioneered a thousand years ago, I think, remains viable more than viable, right? This is how you're going to get, like, so I have on my desk right now um, I have a little version. I have two versions. I have a, about this size, a, a copy of uh, Mount Rushmore. I also have one that's this big. I'm like, that I actually got at Mount Rushmore <laughs> in the gift shop under, I tell this story all the time. Some of you have heard it before. I apologize. Uh, big handwritten sign in the gift shop. Uh, it's hanging, it's like a ceiling like this, hanging down from the drop ceiling on wires. A cardboard sign, handwritten. Genuine faux granite, it said. <laughs> Somebody could have used a little more education along the way. Uh, so I bought one. Well, you, can't, you can't pass up a genuine faux granite <laughs> imitation Mount Rushmore. So I have that as well. But who's on Mount Rushmore, right? I'm not, you don't, it's not a quiz. You don't have to actually answer. 
those four men had the same education, essentially, that we are giving our students. They read the same books. They asked the same questions. They wrestled with the same problems, right? Why are they on Mount Rushmore, though? George Washington isn't there because uh, he sort of, you know, he was not good at rinse and repeat. He didn't sort of, I'm going to do what my ancestors did over and over and over again. No, he faced crises that are, were without precedent. How do you prepare to be George Washington? Right, there's, there is no course of, of study that prepares you to lead a revolution, to father a country, to help create a constitution. What he had was a classical education that taught him to ask questions and to answer them and to think clearly about even new things. All of them are there because they face the same, same kind of problem. Here's a whole new problem that nobody's ever seen before. What do you do with this? They found a way. And how did they find a way? Partly because they had an education that helped them learn how to find ways where ways don't yet exist. You can't recreate that in some other fashion. You can't, you know, don't measure with credit units, please. Don't even try. Uh, but that's what we do here. And that's what, that's what other schools have done in the past. We don't have to recreate the wheel, right? We're not reinventing it. Uh, we're just putting it back on where it belongs. It's now five after, and I promised that we would be done at four, which means I probably uh, deceived you on some level. We'll stop here. But let me ask, though, if we have just maybe a moment if, to indulge. Any questions or anything else that, um, anything I went over too quickly or you wish I hadn't said? Yeah. So, yeah, so we are, again, sort of very simplistic in our approach, right? Uh, our, there's two ways to answer that question. So very technically right now it's an English degree. Uh, but that's because we're applying to uh, the accrediting body to offer a great books degree. And English is sort of like a holding uh, container till we get that approval. So what we ultimately intend to offer is a Bachelor of Arts in great books. It's a four-year program. We do have a two-year version, though. So uh, we actually, I think, have at least one or two students who would do something like this right now. They come stay for two years, do the general ed part, and then transfer to another school. But because we're accredited, they can take the accredited gen ed portion with them and go get the major they want somewhere else. So we have some four-year and some two-year students, but it's definitely a four-year option. And most of our students are four-year. That's a, that's a great question. Uh, the, the great books approach allows us to cover lots of different subjects at the same time, right? So, uh, you know, Aristotle is a great, great example of this. That guy wrote on everything, right? There's almost a, no subject he didn't talk about, right? Uh, so, you know, we will do even science sometimes. We will do, uh, you know, we'll read Galileo. Um, we'll do philosophy. We'll do literature. We'll do theology in the context of those great books, but we do it chronologically. You know, so rather than sort of, this is it's another thing, uh, that's exactly how education was up until the early 1900s in every university in the world, practically. Uh, this notion that you would sort of break it up into these sort of, uh, frankly, artificial disciplines, right? That, why does this happen? I used to, drove me crazy, but I, I know I used to drive my professors in graduate school crazy. I have a degree in government, political science, right? And uh, I would, I would I'd write a paper, a term paper, and I would quote like a historian, and they would get very angry at me. You can't quote, this is a political science program, you can't quote historians. Said, but this happened in the past, doesn't matter, doesn't matter. <laughs> and if I really wanted to get them, I became, I would sometimes tweak, I admit. Uh, uh, I would quote like literature, and they would just go <laughs> ballistic. Oh, that's like, the worst thing you could do. Those are artificial barriers, nobody lives like that. Right, again, think about the, meta George Washington, well, this is, my, this is my sociology time over here, I don't, no, he doesn't. It's integrated, right? We, we think big thoughts, and, and if literature helps, if philosophy helps, if whatever, we, that's what we do. We bring it all together. Uh, so there's no reason to have those bizarre sort of, you know, hermetically sealed compartments. And so we don't, for the most part. Now, having said that, there are a few exceptions to that, right? So uh, some things don't, I think, lend themselves as well to that approach. Uh, so, for example, our students will learn college algebra. That's a separate sort of set-aside course while they will work through the, the principles of algebra. Okay, that's fine. Um, a few other fit that condition as well. But for the most part, we integrate them right into the great books chronologically. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's a good question. That's hard to, um, there's no, uh, nobody anywhere can ever really answer that question. Uh, it's always up to the graduate school to decide if they'll take you or not, right? Uh, you mentioned sort of the cost of graduate school. I won't even address that issue. But here's the thing, and this is true actually both at the undergraduate and the graduate level. There are the elites that are always super selective, right? And they, they, they can afford to say no to anybody they want to. 
And so they create, they have to make up reasons not to let you in. Seriously, like, how does Harvard Law decide who to let in? It's crazy. Uh, this was just, just wasn't black ink. He's out. Right? So it's very fickle in that sense. right? So at the elite level, I, I don't know how you get into them. Like, nobody can really answer that question for you. But you get below the elite level, they are all desperate for students, actually. Like, they need the money. They need you. They need you to come and pay for it, right? Oddly enough, this is going to sound shocking, uh, at most places, graduate schools, the graduate programs, that's where the cash comes in. All we've been saying, undergraduate education is expensive for them in a certain sense. Uh, at least 30% of the income has to be paid for. <laughs> it goes back to, when it comes to graduate school, very little goes back, probably even less than 30%, well under. So they need the graduate students. Uh, lots of schools will find reasons to admit you because they need to find a way to get you in. They need, again, they need the resource. They need the money from the student. So uh, if you're coming from an accredited school and you can demonstrate, for example, uh, you have a credible program. Uh, look, I've, I worked hard in these ways. I had to produce these things. Uh, usually there's, I hate this, but usually there's a test involved, right? A GRE, an LSAT, an MCAT. Uh, you do well on that test and you show that you had a legitimate you know, curriculum in your school. It doesn't really matter what the school was. It doesn't even matter what your major was. Uh, I know lots, of, I, I, on several occasions, I had students who were fine arts majors who would go like to law school or to, I mean, you name it, right? Uh, the major and the graduate program don't have to line up at all. It's actually becoming quite common that they don't line up. I wasn't thinking of you, but yes. <laughs> Yeah, a lot, of, a lot of schools are just waiving the, even the score. Uh, they don't keep, so what, again, if, now, again, paying for it's a different issue. I don't know how, I look, I don't know how anybody's got to pay for graduate school. I don't begin to answer that. <laughs> Maybe robbing the occasional bank, I don't know. But, so, so di oh, we're definitely out of time now. Let me, let me just go, uh, say that I'm just glad you were here today. You, you, you are troopers, you persevered to the end, so I appreciate that. And uh, if you want to talk more some other time, just you know, let me know, give me a call, drop me an email. I'll be happy to talk with any of you, one-on-one, two-on-one, 50-on-one, whatever it takes. <laughs> Thank you very much. You guys have a great evening.